logic. I'm Mark Thorsby. This is an online course covering the basics of categorical, propositional, and predicate logic. We're using a concise introduction to logic by Patrick Hurley. In this lesson, we're going to take a look just at some basic concepts, and we'll be looking at section 1.2, recognizing arguments, and in particular, differentiating arguments from non-arguments or other forms of statements. Okay, so welcome back. Let me just start off with a since in this session we're going to be looking at recognizing arguments, let's start off by asking, reviewing what exactly an argument is. We, in our first video, 1.1, we looked at the idea that arguments contain two different things, really. On the one hand, they contain premises, and on the other hand, they contain conclusions. Right? And they're linked inferentially. There's an inferential link between the premises and the conclusion. I should say conclusion. Premises and the conclusion. Now, one thing to notice here is what is the premise? The premise is the evidence that one gives for the claim that they want you to accept as being true. Okay. Now, the evidence, though, that means that the sort of statements that are given in a premise are what we call factual statements or factual claims. This is the term your book uses. Um, whereas a conclusion, by contrast, is an inferential claim. Right? It's an inferential claim. Meaning that it's a claim that results from being an inference from that's derived from the premises. Okay? Now, in terms of the inferential claims, you can have both explicit as well as implicit inferential claims. Right? So you can have explicit as well as implicit inferential claims. Now, the, why am I mentioning all this? Because, because um, when we look, about, we look at the idea of creating arguments, uh, let me make a little more space here. If we're going to be talking about recognizing arguments, then that means we have to recognize arguments from non-arguments. Right? So that's sort of what we're actually going to be talking about today is non-arguments. In the first class, of non-arguments or what we would what we call non-inferential passages. These are non-inferential. I'm gonna your book says non-inferential uh, statement uh, passages. I'm just gonna say non-inferential statements. Right? These non-inferential statements are basically groups of utterances of words and sentences that do things, but they don't provide arguments because there's no inference. There's no inference to be made. Let me give you an example here. I'll just go through some of these. Uh, warnings, for instance. Warnings. If I say, watch out for the truck, right? Um, that has definite meaning, right? But the meaning, uh, the there's not. it doesn't have a conclusion. The conclusion, conclusion is not, watch out for the truck. It's simply a warning. It's not the result. Conclusions have to be the result of an inferential um, movement, right? And their warnings don't have those. So a warning is not an inferential statement, and therefore it's not an argument. Advice is another example here. If someone gives you advice, that's not the same as giving you an argument. And oftentimes advice can sort of look like uh, an argument, but it's not strictly speaking the same thing. Let me give you an example here. From the textbook here and what I'm looking at here for those of you who are watching through YouTube uh, this is the 11th edition of Patrick Hurley's um, introduction a concise introduction to logic and this is 1.2 okay so let's go up here okay here we are advice All right here's an example you should keep a few things in mind before buying a used car test drive the car at various speeds and conditions examine the oil in the crankcase, ask to see service records, and if possible, have the engine and powertrain checked by a mechanic. Now, that, that's good advice if you're going to buy a car. But this is not an argument, right? You may be inclined to think that, well, isn't this the conclusion? Well, that's what they want you to think, but the thing is, the whole thing is advice. There's, not, there's no inference here, right? There's no evidence to say that this is what you should do. He's just saying you should do it, or she's saying that. So a piece of advice doesn't count as an argument because there's no inference, there's no relationship between these statements such that if you just saw, one way to think about it is like this. Uh, an argument is one if you saw the premises, you can sort of 
figure out what the conclusion is without it being stated at all, right? It can be purely an implicit inference, okay? Another example here of a non-inferential claim is a statement of belief or an opinion. So let's throw that down here. People's opinions do not count as argument. Now, good opinions, if, you, if someone has an opinion you ask them why, hopefully they'll give you an argument, but the opinion itself is not an argument, right? That's just what someone thinks, okay? So just be, and lots of people, think, a lot of times, um, especially with new students in an introduction to philosophy course or something, they'll tell me what their opinions are, but they don't give me arguments. For instance, they'll say, I believe God exists, and that's it, right? That's not an argument, right? Think of an argument as a way of proving, convincing others to agree with you about what you believe. Right? So an opinion is not an argument. Okay? Besides opinions, another thing to watch out for, uh, another form of non-inferential statements to watch out for, are what we might call loosely associated statements. Loosely associated statements. Now, a series, you can have a series of statements that are sort of related, so they're sort of associated together, but they are not uh, related clearly in terms of there being an inferential connection. If we go back to the book, here's the example that Hurley gives. It's actually from Lao Tzu. Not to honor men of worth will keep the people from contention. Not to value good things that are hard to come by will keep them from theft. Not to display what is desirable will keep them from being unsettled of mind. Now, this is sort of a famous and sort of deep insight, perhaps. But this isn't an argument. It's not an argument because there's no evidence to support this stuff. Right, the, You could find evidence to support it, but as it's actually written out here, it's merely just a loosely associated statement. It's sort of, ex it's sort of someone expounding on a general subject, but, the, but expounding itself is not an argument. So you have to watch out for loosely associated statements. Another sort of, uh, sort of um, utterance or passage you might see that does, shouldn't count as an argument is a report. Right? A report is merely... Um, telling you what has happened or what someone thinks has happened, but it's not proving it. And that's one thing to remember is the arguments, well, maybe we can put that up here, arguments aim to prove. They aim to prove. The difference between a report is a report is just telling you what we think is true. It's not actually proving, doing the work of proving it. So reports are not arguments either right for instance if someone's if you if someone said for instance the witnesses saw that man running away from the murder scene um so it seems like he might be the murderer right uh, that's a report of what someone might think is the case but that's not strictly speaking an argument but you can see even that example i just gave sounds kind of like an argument um, and the real sort of trick here i mean in fact i would say the hardest part of logic overall is actually being able to differentiate arguments from non-arguments, okay? So we have non-inferential statements, okay? Oops, I wanted to erase that. Um, we have non-inferential statements, but there are also other types of uh, non-arguments out there, right, besides non-inferential statements. For another category would be what we call expository passages expository passages or statements. Now, what is an expository? An expository is to talk about an exposition, right? It's, and you can see the root word here is to expose, right? So an expository passage is a passage or it's a series of statements that seek to expose an idea, but their, their goal of exposing is not the same thing as proving, okay? So for instance, um, yeah, for instance, well, here I'll give you an ex Usually expository passages are kind of long, but let's give you an example here. Uh, here's, the, here's two different examples. We'll go with the bottom one here uh, that Hurley gives. There's a stylized relation of artist to mass audience in the sports, especially in baseball. Each player develops a style of his own, the swagger as he steps to the plate, the unique wind-up a pitcher has, the clean swing and hard driving hits, the precision, quickness, and grace of infield and outfield, the sense of surplus power behind whatever is done. You can see here, what is this, um, what is this guy, what is this uh, 
state passage actually give. And from in the untrained or the uninitiated, this may look like an argument where uh, if you're not thinking too closely, right, it might look like this first thing is the conclusion, but that's not correct. And it could be a conclusion perhaps in a different passage, right, but not in this one. Because what is all of this? Remember, an argument has to have both a premise and a conclusion. What we have here is, right, this is a stylized relation of artist to mass audience in sports, especially in baseball. And then what the rest of this stuff does is it just goes further on in terms of exposing this idea. The idea here is that you can think of a baseball player, an athlete here as an artist, right? Um, and then we say each player develops a style, the swagger, blah, 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 blah. This is just further exposing the idea, further developing the idea, but it doesn't in fact, um, I'm sorry, it doesn't in fact actually prove anything, right? So an expository passage, these are passages that develop ideas, right? They develop ideas, but they don't prove them, right? So if you are conclusions without premises, so that's why they're not arguments, okay? Um, so that's the first thing we should see there. Now, another type, another category of non-arguments are what we call illustrations. Now, what is an illustration meant to do? An illustration is meant to explain. We'll say illustra illustrations explain, they help to explain ideas by means of illustrations, right? But they explain ideas, but they don't prove ideas. There's no proof in an illustration. The illustration just make, clarifies a specific idea, right? And maybe that's what we say, you know, it explains or clarifies an idea, okay? Now, a typical form of illustration is, in, is one by an example, right, by giving an example. Now, or explanations. Let's throw that up there. Now, explanations are really tricky, actually, because you're going to see that one of the things you're going to have to do for your homework here is you're going to have to differentiate arguments from non-arguments, and there's going to be some which are explanations. Explanations are a bit tricky, and let me just explain why. Let's go down here and pick out an explanation from the textbook. Right. Um, okay, so let me just select this and we can take a look at it. Uh, whoops, what's this? Yeah, sorry about that. All right, let's get let's take take a look at this example. The sky appears blue from the Earth's surface because, boom, boom, boom. Immediately, you might think this is an argument because look, we said because is an indicator term, right? So you have to be careful here because that means explanations have indicator terms too. The sky appears blue from the Earth's surface because light rays from the sun are scattered by particles in the atmosphere. Okay, now this is not an argument. So let's write that here. This is not an argument. This is an explanation, right? It looks like an argument, especially because it has this indicator term, but it's not, okay? Because what there's two forms. Every explanation has two things. What an ex, Every explanation has both an explanons and an explanandum. And let me write this up here. Now, the explanandum is what gets explained. Whereas the explanons is the means of explanation. This is the way in which it gets explained. This is the means of explanation. Right? So if we go up here, ask yourself, this is someone trying to explain something and the sky appears blue from the Earth's surface, this is the explanandum, right? Or actually, let's draw an X here. This is the explanandum. Whereas the rest of this stuff, maybe I'll have to change the color here, right? The light rays from the sun are scattered by particles in the atmosphere. This is the explanons, okay? So you can see here that explanations have an explanandum and an explanons, which makes it really tricky because arguments by contrast, oops, 
arguments, by contrast, have premises and they have conclusions. And the conclusion is supposed to support, I'm sorry, the premise is supposed to support the conclusion, right? Whereas the explanase is supposed to support the explanandum. But the difference here is that the, what, the difference consists in the goal. The goal is to help you understand what, this, what the first statement means. Whereas the argument is meant to prove it, right? So this doesn't prove it, it merely explains it. Um, so that's the difference here between an explanation is that an explanation has this explanons and an explanandum, which means there's a structural similarity between explanations and arguments, which makes them rather tricky here. Okay, let me start a new note here. Okay, one other type of non-argument or what we would call conditional statements. A conditional statement. Now, what is a conditional statement? A conditional statement is any if-then statement, right? If you listen to the lectures, then you're going to learn about logic. That's a conditional statement. We have to be careful, though, because a conditional statement is not an argument in itself, but we're going to see that some arguments have conditional statements as premises. But a conditional statement all by itself doesn't count as an argument, okay? Now, there's just like the explanation had an explanandum and an explanance, there's two types, two um, things within a conditional statement that we have to identify. Let's just to make so let's say if x, then y. Okay? If x, then y. Now, um, this thing here, the, the x here, is what we call the antecedent. And the y here is what we call the consequent. And this is going to become really, really actually important um, in chapter 4. Um, and, well, actually throughout the entire course, uh, this sort of thing. So you're going to have to eventually learn the difference between antecedents and consequence. The antecedent is the if-then. The if-then. Uh, the consequence is easy to remember because the consequent is always a... Uh, well, it's the consequence of the antecedent, okay? So conditional statements are not arguments by themselves, but with every conditional statement has both an antecedent and a consequent. This will become important because we'll see that some arguments have conditional statements as premises um, in order to make their conclusion, right? So for instance, imagine if I say, if it's raining outside, then you're going to get wet, right? It is raining outside, therefore you are going to get wet. That is a, um, an argument, actually, that's made up of conditional statements, but has more than one. So just one conditional statement is not an argument, or in themselves, conditional statements are not arguments. Okay? Um, and that's the sort of, that's become a pretty important later on. Um, the last thing, you'll see that mainly in terms of recognizing arguments, this chapter is sort of really about how to translate them. And what you're going to have to do is it's going to give you passages so you have to differentiate. The last thing I want to talk about here is the difference between necessary and sufficient conditions. Conditions. Uh, especially when we talk about conditional statements, right? What's, a, what's the difference between a necessary condition and a sufficient condition? A necessary, well, uh, when we talk about necessary and sufficient conditions, really... We're talking about, in conditional statements, you have antecedents and you have consequence. We're really talking about the antecedents right now, right? Because um, think, if you want something to happen, if you want some sort of consequent to happen, then you have to, then the antecedent is what enables that consequent to occur. That antecedent can either be a necessary condition or a sufficient condition, or it could be a necessary and a sufficient condition. So there's really three possibilities there. Let me give you an example here. Um, a necessary, well, actually, let me go back here, right? Uh, let me actually throw, jump to the textbook here and give you the explanation here um, that Hurley gives because I think he lays it out fairly nicely. Okay, let's see, this loads. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Take a look at this. 
let's highlight this. Okay, oops. We didn't highlight. Oh, they do highlight. Okay, a sufficient condition for, uh, let's see, a conditional statements are especially important in logic many fields because they express the relationship between necessary and sufficient conditions. A, oh, I guess I should, should have highlighted the whole thing. A is said to be a sufficient condition for B whenever the occurrence of A is all that is needed for the occurrence of B. Okay, so a sufficient condition means that if if you have A, that's all you need. to get B, okay? That's all you need to get B, okay? So that's a sufficient condition. So a sufficient conditions are more powerful than necessary conditions, actually, right? So let me give you the example here and say, um, if you go, if it's raining outside, you know, no, say, if you're outside and it's raining, then you're gonna get wet, okay? Now, get, getting wet here is the consequence, if you will, and, or the consequent, rather. And then, but standing outside while it's raining here, that is a sufficient condition. That's all you need to get wet, is just to be standing outside while it's raining. So that's a sufficient condition, right? Um, that's all you need, right? Whereas a necessary condition, let's go jump back to Hurley and see how he finds it. On the other hand, a necessary, on the other hand, B is said to be a necessary condition for A, whenever A cannot occur without the occurrence of B. And you can ask yourself this, is that a necessary condition is um, what is required, what is required to make something happen. But not necessarily all that's required. But, but not all that is required. To get B. Um, okay, just to keep our A and B thing. So a necessary condition is when A is what is required to make something happen, but that's not all that is required to get B. Okay, so that's a necessary condition is this has to occur, but more things than this have to occur. Okay, so for instance, let's think about it like this. What if I make this claim? I say, if you want to get an A, right, if you want to get an A in a course, then you must do homework, okay? Now, okay, ask yourself, if you want to get A, then you must do homework, right? So strictly speaking, if you want to get an A, this is the antecedent and this is the consequent, okay? But let's think about this. This whole thing expresses what? Does it express a necessary condition or does it express a sufficient condition? Well, think about this. If you do your homework, if you do your homework, is that all you need to do to get an A? Obviously not. You have to do well on your homework to get an A, and you probably have to take tests, etc., etc. Right. So doing your homework is a necessary condition for getting an A, but it's not a sufficient condition because there's other things you have to do in order to get an A. Right. So there's a difference here between necessary and sufficient conditions. I hope that makes sense in general. Here's an example that Hurley gives. Right. It and these express. Um, if X is a dog, then X is an animal. If X is not an animal, then X is not a dog, right? So the first statement says that being a dog is a sufficient condition for being an animal, right? Because all, all, in order to be an animal, all you have to do is, become a, is be a dog, right? Um, so if X is not an animal, then X is not a dog. This second section expresses a necessary condition rather than a sufficient condition, okay? Now, since we're talking about recognizing arguments, I want you to sort of keep all of this stuff in mind. That you can have warnings, you can have advice, you can have beliefs, opinions, associated statements, reports, expository passages, illustrations, explanations, and conditional statements. And we've talked a little bit about the fundamental elements of explanations. They both have an explanandum as well as an explanons. And conditional statements have antecedents as well as consequence. And then, but then also, we have to just, it's sort of really separate and it confuses a lot of people, but, and I hope I haven't 
confuse you. Um, but then we also make the distinction between sufficient and necessary conditions as well. And as you go through this, this will start to make sense. So when you jump here to your exercises or go to your Alplia, you'll see that what you have to do is you have to figure out what counts as an argument. And if it's not an argument, the book wants you to figure out what kind of non-argument you're actually looking at. Okay? Um, so that's the end of section 1.2. Um, and that's where take, what we've taken a look at. Okay, and that's what the homework is about. Okay, in our next video, we're going to move on and we're going to start talking about um, the difference between deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. In our first, in our first, very first video, we did take a look at, uh, we, I, or at least I, in the second video, I mentioned the difference between deduction and induction. Um, in our next video here, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at deduction and induction in a very precise sense, okay? So that's video 1.2. Thanks a lot for listening. I'll see you guys online.